Greetings. I would like to welcome you to the CHCI session on Afro-Latino identity and racism, a frank conversation. My name is Maria Ibanez, and I am the Vice President of Communications at CHCI. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Univision Communications and Cargill Incorporated for their generous support of this session. One of the issues facing the Hispanic community is the need for recognition of our diversity, particularly Afro-Latinos or Black Latinos. While studies show that one out of four Latinos is of African descent, this reality is not accurately reflected among leaders, media images, or conversation in the Latino community. Today, you will have an opportunity to hear from our panel of Afro-Latino leaders as they engage in an honest and frank conversation about their experience and how we can build a more inclusive and equitable Latino community. Today's discussion will be moderated by Marco Davis, President and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Marco has more than 25 years of experience in leadership development, educational achievement, community advocacy, and civic engagement. Before joining CHCI, he was a partner at New Profit, a national nonprofit venture philanthropy where he led an effort to create a more equitable social sector and served as organizational lead on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Markle served in the Obama administration as deputy director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics and as director of public engagement for the Corporation for National and Community Service. Marco is not new to getting people to talk about Afro-Latino issues. At Yale University, he joined a historically black fraternity while also becoming involved with Latino groups on campus. He continuously explores fundamental challenges of being Afro-Latino and the need for the inclusion of Afro-Latinos across all industries and leadership roles. Recently, CHCI held a discussion series, Dialogos, Standing Up to Racial Injustice, where Marco facilitated two discussions on anti-Blackness within the Latinx and policy solutions to combat racial inequity. I hope you enjoy the session and what is sure to be a very lively discussion. And please don't forget to continue the conversation on social media using hashtag CHCIHHM20. Hello, my name is Marco Davis. As you just heard, I'm the president and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. First, I wanna thank our audience for joining us for a full week of virtual programming here at our 2020 Leadership Conference. Thank you so much for being here and please continue to follow us throughout the conference with the hashtag CHCIHHM20. We have a great two more days of a wonderful conference ahead, uh, but for now we're gonna get into a conversation on Afro-Latino identity and racism. As the nation has begun to reckon with the topic of race and perhaps the most in-depth conversation to date, the same subject has surfaced within the Latino community. As a result, I believe we're coming to terms with the racial diversity of our own population. So at CHCI, we decided that if we're gonna commit to eliminating racism from society in America, we need to make sure to talk about race and racism entre nos within our own community and overcome that, especially because many of us are supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement. We believe that we're allies for the black community in, in America, and yet sometimes we haven't had that conversation among ourselves. So today I'm proud that we're gonna have uh, a lineup of panelists, all of whom are Afro-Latinos. This is an entire session comprised of Afro-Latinos, yes, including me, uh, as you might've heard in the intro video. We're gonna have a frank conversation about our experience in this nation, in our own communities, and about what we can do to help advance the diversity of our community and to help, again, eliminate some of the racism that we find that exists not just in the United States, but uh, throughout the country. I'm delighted to be joined today by a group of leaders and friends, uh, and I'm only gonna give the briefest of introductions because we've included all of our speakers' uh, full bios on the website. 
In fact, uh, I recommend that you click on their photos on the website to not only learn more about them, but in fact, uh, there are links to their social media handles so you can follow and engage with them directly. Uh, as we've described, as we'll talk about, you'll hear in a minute, you know, Afro-Latinos are not yet visible enough in a variety of ways within our own community or in American society. And so here's a whole set of folks that you can point to. You can help elevate, you can engage uh, in your work and help advance this conversation. So let me get to bringing in the panels. And as I said, very brief introductions. First, I wanna welcome Sid Wilson, the president and CEO of Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility. Hey, Sid. Next, we have Ilya Calderon, co-anchor of Noticiero Univision and co-host of Aquí y, a, a, Aquí y Ahora at Univision Communications. And Ilya, by the way, recently published her first book, and I think she's going to tell us a little bit about, about that uh, in just a minute. We also have Catherine Unger, Vice President of North American Government Relations at Cargill Incorporated. And last but certainly not least, we're pleased to have Congressman Adriano Espaillat, who represents New York's 13th District. He, by the way, also serves in a leadership role with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus as CHC Whip. And so we're very grateful that he works with us here at CHCI quite a bit. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, and by the way, for the audience, uh, please feel free to submit questions for our panelists uh, with the, uh, the Q&A function uh, on the side. And in the, in the comments you have, use those in the chat. So let's jump right in first. Um, why don't we go down the line and ask, see if each of you can share just the briefest opening remarks on your relationship to the topic, how you identify as an Afro-Latino or Afro-Latina. Let's start with you, Sid. Uh, thank you, Marco, and thank you, everyone. I appreciate the invitation um, on a topic that's really very important and a topic that doesn't get discussed enough, uh, Afro-Latinos, uh, in, in America. Uh, for, for me, as the son of two Dominican American uh, parents who uh, came to the United States from the Dominican Republic uh, uh, to, uh, to achieve their dream of, a, of, a, of opening up the first Dominican medical practice um, and raising me not only as a proud Dominican, but also as a proud Afro-Latino. Um, for me, this connection is uh, is, is one that's, that, that a lot of Afro-Latinos can uh, relate to. The reality is, is that as president and chief executive officer of the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility, uh, Marco Davis and I are the only two Afro-Latino CEOs of any Hispanic organization in the country. And, uh, and I only became CEO six years ago and then Marco uh, Davis uh, afterwards. So up until that point, there has never been Afro-Latinos leading Hispanic organizations. And this is important because while we uh, advocate on Hispanic issues, when we take our suits off, when we dress casually, shorts, chancletas, um, t-shirts, and we go outside, we're black in America. And as two black men, um, we experience the same issues that impact African-Americans throughout this country. And so I look forward to talking about this topic because for me, um, being uh, uh, an Afro-Latino is about the fact that I, uh, I embrace who I am uh, as a Dominican, as a Latino, but also the fact that my ancestry traces back to Africa. Thank you, Sid. <laughs> Powerful words. Ilya. Well, I'm a proud Afro-Latina, and, and I think we have a little problem, and I, that's why I love... Um, uh, moments like this and conferences like this, because with the beginning of the Hispanic Heritage Month, we all begin to see, you know, many celebrations, forums, recognition of the cultures, the ethnicities, and it's now the time to celebrate the power in our community, but the power of the Afro-Latino community. For decades, the Afro-Latino community has been like invisible during these celebrations. This has, you know, had an impact negative impact in, in our countries and does also follow, you know, the United States when we migrate to the United States. According to the Pew Research, one out of four Hispanics has African roots. So we must talk about and have these uncomfortable conversations for so many. It is time for our community to be visible. I'm so proud and I'm glad to be here with Marco and, and Sid, which, you know, who are pioneers. I am the first 
Afro-Latina to anchor a main show in Spanish in the United States. It took so long, 2017, but I want to make sure that I am not the only one, that that door that opened for me remains open for more Afro-Latinos, for norm, more minorities. And that is a part of um, one of the reasons why I published my book, My Time to Speak, because it is hard for us to reach these positions three, four times harder than it is for, for a white person to reach this position. But we need to have allies on the decision-making side. We can study, we can work, we can you know double shift, whatever you name it. But if we don't have allies on the decision makers, we are we are alone. So we need we need to to work together and 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 um and make sure that these windows and doors remain open for new generations. Thank you, Ilian. Thank you for sharing your story via via the book. So no no my time to speak, right? You said it's the name. So make sure for pick it up. We're happy to support that and promote it. Catherine, over to you. Yeah, hi. So my father is black and not Latino. My mother was born and grew up mostly in Puerto Rico. And like Sid, um, because of my accent and because of the way I look, most people immediately assume that I'm not of Latin descent. So my experience in the U.S. has been largely colored by that. However, my background has given me a perspective that most Americans don't have, and it's left me incredibly aware of not only how Black Americans are treated, but also how, how um, Latin Americans of African descent are treated. And, you know, we talk about, for example, Equal Pay Day uh, for Black women. That hit in August, for those of you who didn't know. For Latin American women, it won't hit until October 29th. And the question that immediately popped into my head when I saw that is, when is Equal Pay Day for Black Latin American women, for Latin American women of Afro descent. How much farther behind October 29th is that date? And so, you know, as Sid said, this is a very relevant discussion. It's one we don't have often, and I'm really excited to be here. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And Congressman Espaillat, speaking of firsts. Well, thank you. Thank you all the panelists. A first race matters. Uh, it continues to matter, and it has matter, and it will continue to matter as we move forward. Uh, it matter when Juan Rodriguez, the first immigrant in 1613, a man of color, came to uh, New York City. Uh, and, and, and it matters uh, when people like Arturo Schomburg uh, created one of the, the most important depository of research in the Afro uh, experience in, in America and the black experience in America. Uh, but I think that in many ways, um, there is a misrepresentation uh, that, uh, that race is, is, uh, ethnicity and they're not, they're separate. You know, you could be a Brazilian of African descent. You could be a Puerto Rican of African descent. You could be a, a Colombian of a Dominican a Cuban, uh, Mexican of, of African descent. So race and ethnicity are separate matters. And I think very often they're, they're bundled together, denying people like us the, the, the ability to mean that we are uh, Latinos of African descent. Uh, this is an important debate uh, because it's very often swept under the, the rug. It is swept under the rug um, in our uh, countries of origin and is often swept under the rug even in the black community. And so uh, this is a debate that must be uh, put forward. Uh, it must be cleared. Uh, it must be uh, uh, discussed out there in a transparent and genuine way that race and ethnicity are separate items. And so as such, you have countries where you have large segments of Lat uh, Latinos of African descent, yet uh, they're considered Brazilians or Dominicans or Puerto Ricans or Cuban or Mexicans, and their race is often ignored. So uh, this is an important issue. We should not be denied uh, our ability to claim our race and ethnicity at the same time. 
Thank you so much. And, and before I continue the questions, I know, Congressman, you're going to have to, to jump off a little bit early. So before before we go to back to the panel and, and to some of the questions I prepared, and by the way, again, audience, we will have some time for Q&A. Just wanted to ask to make sure to give you a chance. Any recommendations or advice you would give to uh, our audience, to, to members of the Latino community who are wrestling with these questions, many of whom I suspect um, are not themselves Afro-Latino, right? How what do you think are some of the best ways that we as a community can tackle this question? What are things that people can do to help elevate the issue, to confront it head on, to try to frankly eliminate some of the racism and anti-blackness we see within our own community? We must be educated on this issue. Uh, and, and, and it should be included in, in the curriculums uh, in schools across mm -hmm. the country. And that's how you get it done, uh, by ensuring that it is taught to our, the children at a very young age in, in a very direct way, uh, uh, depicting uh, historical figures that were so important to our nation of origin and, and the United States of America. In our effort to have a, a Latino and Hispanic museum, and I know Sid Wilson is involved in that, there must be uh, a segment of that that addresses this particular issue. Uh, it must not be ignored once again or swept under the rug. It must be out there, it must be front and center, and we must start uh, with our very young uh, children. I know that there are some aspects of this discussion. Hair, the tone of your skin. Um, I know that I looked at my passport when I came to uh, the United States uh, as a young boy in the Dominican Republic and under race, it had Indio. And, but I understand that there were different categories, Indio Claro, Indio Oscuro, Negro. And so, you know, we must clear that up uh, and we must be uh, forthright and transparent in our discussion, not just amongst ourselves, but I think we need to have a full discussion about this with the Afro-American community as well. Thank you so yeah, much for, for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, thank you for being here, for sure. We appreciate that. Um, so panelists, if, if you all wanna jump in, obviously as always, feel free. And and I think some some of what uh, the Congressman just mentioned is, is a place I'd like to go to right now, which is talking about some of the the, the, the historical context, right? I think there's, there's, some, there's some history, there's some precedent, and I don't know if, if any of you had any insights or thoughts you wanted to share about um, the ways, for example, in which race is addressed in Latin America having influence and or impact on the way in which we talk about race within the Latino community in the U.S. Any, any thoughts on that? I think, um, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Catherine, go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> right. Thanks, Ilya. I was just going to mention that, um, you know, I've been thinking about this quite a bit for the last, you know, couple of decades. And in 97, I spent a year teaching at a university in Colombia and met this remarkable man. Uh, his name was Juan de Dios Mosquera, and he was leading a civil rights movement in, in Colombia. I think his Cimarron movement remains active. But he made a comment to me that has stuck with me for these 23 years. And, and he said, Catherine, the difference between the U.S. and much of Latin America is that there were no laws in Colombia that mandated discrimination, right? It was managed by social constructs. He said, you can challenge an unfair law, you can fight for legislative change and point to the constitution, but how do you fight something that exists in hearts and minds and not on paper? So if discrimination is not acknowledged by the society in which you live, then there are no laws to change and, and there's nothing to fight. How do you fight it? How do you even prove that it exists? So the um, treatment of Latinos of African descent here in the US is a legacy of the historic treatment of Latinos in Latin America. And if there's been this denial that that discrimination even exists, oh, we didn't do what the US did. We didn't put laws on paper. Okay, but then you didn't give us anything to fight and to battle. And so that that comment really did stick with me. Um, and I thought I'd share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think yes. you were going to add something. Uh, yeah, my comment was, you know, precisely talking about Colombia, because I am Colombia. And our history 
is being whitened. Absolutely. In our textbooks, we never knew, we never learned about a black abolitionist. And they, he wasn't given the, the place he deserved in history. The portrait of the perfect family as a white family, and then the, the blacks were the enslaved people or the people that work in the houses or on the fields. So that's the story that from Argentina to Mexico, going through all our islands, have been taught. The kids have been taught that we are less of a person, we are less smart, because we are never portrayed as important as we are. In Colombia, a, on, the only Black president that we had had in our history, his portrait was hidden for 157 years wow. on a dusty room until former President Santos decided to give him the space he deserved in the Hall of Presidents in the Presidential House. So that, that way, since the, 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 um, the textbooks in primary, in elementary school, to the productions on TV, everything is white. I never saw an anchor or a journalist that looked like me when I was growing up in Colombia. And that raises in those microaggressions, as um, congressmen explain, el pelo malo, don't marry a, a, a black guy, we need to mejorar la raza. All those microaggressions migrate with us to the United States. And then immigrants come here, not black immigrants, they come here and they tend to identify with the white European because they know there is discrimination. And some of they even denying the 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 uh, African roots because there is, you know, there is fear of what is going on, of the racism, of facing racism again in the United States. And it happens. Sometimes you are too Hispanic to be black or too black to be Hispanic. When I came here, people are like, oh, are there black people in Colombia? Because Colombia doesn't tell. Colombia doesn't tell the story of the black community. So we need to reinforce, we need to change education. We need to take to, to teach even the non-black kids about the important figures of our community, of the, the, the black leaders. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And and so bringing that, you know, now to our present experiences, I know my experience, similar to, to Catherine, because of my particular heritage, my father is Jamaican, my mother is Mexican, right? So my father is not of technically of Latino descent, he's a black American. Um, one of the questions I got fairly often, frankly, from both and arguably all communities, but certainly I found particularly uh, interesting uh, when engaging in conversations within the Latino community was, was questions that were framed and meant to be just, you know, curious. Uh, but as we know, sort of there's meaning embedded within when I would ask questions of like, which do you feel more of, right? Do you feel more black or do you feel more Latino? Right. Or, or, you know, uh, you're not quite as Latino because of your dad's background. You're only half, right. As I, as I tell younger generations, I, I grew up in the era of fractions where it was, you're a half this and a half that or a quarter this and a quarter that. And I think thankfully younger generations are not accepting this idea of breaking you down. It's all part of your identity. I wonder if you all have similar thoughts or insights that, that help can help people reflect on how they interact with us, how they treat us, how they do or don't welcome or include us, which I think is part of what stems from the kind of invisibility and lack of representation of our of our population. You want to share? And Sid, I think maybe like I think you've talked a little bit about the, the guest effect, I think you called it. Yeah, uh, you, you uh, it's I call it the guest effect. Um, the guest effect is when you're welcomed, you're embraced, you're invited to dinner, but you can't be a member, which means that sometimes with families, I'll be close to you, just don't marry my daughter. Um, you can be involved with us, but you just can't be a member, but you can always be a guest and we'll welcome you, we'll embrace you. And a lot of Afro-Latinos often get, feel like, we are often guests, guests within the Latino community and guests within the within the African American community, uh, and the and this is a a challenge that needs to be addressed from both sides uh, because of the fact that when we hear oh we treat you great we do this I said that's true, 
but you won't go as far as ask me to be a member, being a part, being a part of the family. And that happens a lot. And that stems a lot um, as Ilya and Catherine uh, and Katrin Adenau were, were mentioning that often happens in our countries where sometimes we'll say, oh my God, you know, uh, you can be friends with them, but I didn't know you're going to marry them. And, you know, and, and, uh, and what does that mean for the family and all these things? And so that's when you really find out um, where the limitations are in terms of embracing Afro-Latinos. And so I call it the guest effect. It's like being, you know, when you go to church and they welcome the guest and you're not a member of the church, but you're a guest and they ask you to stand up and welcome you, they shake hands, they, they hug you. Um, but when it comes to Afro-Latinos in our communities, often it's the, it's, it's the guest effect which must be addressed. Yeah, yeah. Anything to add folks on that idea? Does that resonate? Oh. It does. And I always think about things now in, in corporate terms, right, because of, of what I've been doing. And so, you know, when I think about um, the fact that it's not by accident that so many Latinos of African descent are among the poorest in Latin America. And, um, you know, the congressman mentioned Brazil, and that immediately came to my mind as well, um, just in terms of the, the absence of, of us being there. And, you know, I've been to a number of at factories of US owned companies in Brazil. And I was always struck by the complete absence of black workers. And I'm not just talking at the office level, white collar professional, but also in uh, entry level plant jobs. And, you know, from a corporate perspective, I do think we need to talk about this, you know, uh, secret identity of, of blackness that's being hidden in Latin America, because we often talk about discrimination and we think about the, the U.S. and improving representation here. And one of the things I hope people listening are, are thinking about as they're listening to this discussion is I urge our HR professionals to get better educated on the lack of. All right, friends. Uh, apologies for the for the brief interruption. I think this topic is so important and such of such interest that I think we overwhelmed and crashed the system. Too many viewers. <laughs> uh, so thank you for being with us. We're back. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna put, uh, push on and continue. Catherine, you were you were sharing, and I, I I think we caught most of it before before the system froze. But um, you you were talking a little bit of I I think well let, let me give you the word and not put words in your mouth. But you were, you were sharing about this experience. Absolutely, I'll just uh, hopefully not repeat too much. But I I do think there's an obligation for us at the corporate level to be aware of what Sid was saying, right? And yeah. if we're talking about representation and ensuring um, a representation of, of Black Americans, we need to think of that not just here in the United States, but also in the rest of Latin America, where that legacy of the impact of slavery continues to exist as well. Yeah. And if we talk to our HR professionals, for example, who are working on that, and if, if they are having discussions with people in Latin America, they may ask, oh, does this discrimination exist? And they may get back an answer, no, we don't have an issue here. Well, as Sid said, you know, there's, there's some, some hidden uh, situations going on there. And if you look across Brazil, and the percentage of Black Americans who live there, but you don't see them represented in factories and offices, then you recognize we do have a challenge. So I think, and I hope that from a corporate perspective, we think about the impact that we can have and the way that we can help to change this. Thank you for that, appreciate it. Um, so two things, one, uh, audience members, uh, now that we are back up, do remember that you can uh, submit any questions you'd like us to talk about in the, in the Q&A function. Um, we'll try to, to try to get to some of those. So please feel free to share any that you have. Um, second, also, as you may have noticed, uh, Congressman Espaillat has had to run. Um, as you know, uh, as you might know, Congress is in session this week. And so um, he's got other legislative business, I know, to attend. But he was able to join us at least for half our session. And we're grateful for that. Um, so I wanted to ask a different question I wanted to, to, to tackle with you all. Um, um, this year, right, of course, COVID-19 has, has disrupted everything. We've, we've been forced to, to, to re-examine a lot of our structures and system, and it, and it revealed a lot of, of disparities, a lot of inequities um, in the ways in which communities have been affected. And then, of course, you take on top of that um, the social action that has taken place over the summer um, that was prompted in some ways by the, the, the brutal murder of George Floyd captured on video 
but then the growing awareness and the realization, right, that it was not an isolated incident, right? And we've got, sadly, far too many stories, Breonna Taylor, um, other folks um, who, who have lost their lives at the hands of uh, violence, frankly. Um, and so now there is a reckoning nationwide around race, um, and, and rightfully so, I believe, um, there's a conversation around racism in our society, and, and particularly, uh, the effort leading to, to, to combat it is the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the Latino community, I think I've seen many, many voices in our community who have expressed complete support for this effort, who have recognized uh, the importance of it. Um, and I think, again, I think that's some of what has precipitated this conversation within our community. I feel like um, uh, my personal take is just that as we support and as we should support um, uh, efforts to dismantle the systemic and structural racism in our society. And as we try to recenter and lift up um, the lives of Black Americans and, and the ways that the legacy of slavery in the United States, to your point, uh, Catherine, um, uh, there is also a need for us to sort of get our house in order, right? There's a need for us to figure out how we ourselves treat our own um, at the same time that we're trying to sort of uh, uh, lend our support and stand in solidarity with uh, the Black American community, if you will. Um, are you seeing that there's new and different conversations around this topic, around Afro-Latinos in your circles? Have you seen people changing the ways? The, the references that, that stand out in my mind that I've seen a lot is people, an awareness that people had around the terminology, right? Pero bueno, bueno, malo like all sorts of, um, uh, uh, in fact, even slang that we now realize, in fact, people have sort of said it never dawned on me until now that that's quite offensive, these slang terms that we use um, and, and diminutives and so on that seem to be terms of endearment, but that, that underlie some deep bias. And people are sort of saying, I cannot let that continue. I can't use it myself and I really need to interrupt when I hear other people say it. Are you finding that or am I just in a different kind of a, a, a space? Is that is that something more widespread in our community, do you think? I think there's a you know a lot to do still with the with the Hispanic community. We need to educate ourselves about the Black history in all America, not only yeah. in the United States but in our countries as well. I think racism is is part of the upbringing in in the Hispanic families. It it, it is there. The phrases that you know the grandmas and las tias everybody repeats about the hair, as you said, the the tone of the skin color they are well present in our lives and they are well present in our families here in the United States as well. So we need to start working with our elder people, with our parents and start educating them as well as the young generations. They, kids are not cruel. I, I don't like when people call kids cruel because they discriminate. They are repeating what other, one, other ones in, in the household or in the house, the, the, the parents who are the, the principal source of information for the kids, they are just repeating what they, what they listen to. So when you call a kid cruel, you are calling yourself cruel because they are learning from you. But I think we need to, to educate ourselves, to learn a little bit more about the fight for civil rights in the United States and acknowledge that that fight benefit the Hispanic and the immigrant community well. And that without the fight for the civil rights in the 60s, immigrants wouldn't be able to send their kids to a public school or they could have ride a public bus or to go to a public park. So we need to, to start you know, working to eradicate it from our families. It is not normal because La Abuelita lo dice, it's not normal. We, we need to start normalizing those microaggressions and educating you know, our um, um, parents and, and grandparents and our kids too. That's great. Um, Marco, let me, if I could add on that real quickly, I think what uh, Elia said is, is really important uh, you know, because it is about um, uh, you know, educating the adults so that we can pass those down. The reality is in the United States, uh, we are taught in high school all about Western civilization, Greece and ancient Rome and everything started there. And, and the only time they talk about Africa is Mesopotamia. 
Uh, and but um, they don't talk about the history of Latin America because few people know this, but everyone thinks that the vast majority of blacks in the Western Hemisphere uh, are in the United States and somehow made their way throughout Latin America. The reality is, is that only 6%, 6% of all the slaves that were taken from Africa and brought to the New World were brought to the 13 colonies. 6%, 94% were spread out throughout Latin America. And the reason why that percentage was so high, which is not taught in our history books, is that the mortality rate uh, of black slaves in Latin America was so high because of all the diseases that were brought to the New World. Um, and, and so it forced uh, uh, Spain, which was, which was one of the major uh, leaders of, of enslavement, as well as England and Portugal and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and the Netherlands. Um, and they were constantly going to Africa, bringing more slaves. And so they were brought to Latin America. Most went to Brazil, but throughout, uh, 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 throughout, throughout the Caribbean, but only 6% made it, made it there. But we're not taught that. And, you know, these are things that need to that we need to know so that we know the history that my Latino, Afro Latino history is not the same as someone that came from who has a European ancestry. So if I could just jump on the back of that, if you don't mind, two seconds. Yeah. Um, one of the big differences that uh, I've noticed between um, what it was to be black in the United States versus what it was to be black in the rest of Latin America was we, we had a, a one drop rule here in the United States. So if you had one drop of black blood, you were black, right? And you were in the same bucket with everyone else, light, dark, no matter. Everybody was the same. And um, what has happened in Latin America, and it was very interesting in a census that was taken in Puerto Rico, I guess the last census, uh, more people self-declared as whites from a percentage perspective in Puerto Rico than the number, than the percentage of people who self-declared as white in the United States. Well, that's just not possible, right? And so, you know, the fact that people are trying to run away from being anything other than white is what you see quite often in Latin America, as opposed to first having this one drop rule. And then in the 60s, a, a Black is Beautiful campaign to help us become proud of who we are and of, of, and of our skin color and of our hair and of being Black. Well, you didn't have any of that in Latin America. And so, you know, as Elia says, if you can help lighten, right, the family, you've done something great. Um, and, and, and that's something that, that I think has not been directly addressed. And as Elia says, has to be directly addressed if we're going to do anything about it. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I've, got a, I've gotten a few questions uh, uh, from the audience that I want to try to work in and see if folks can tackle. Thankfully, I think some of them we've addressed, but I want to I want to raise some other ones. Um, particularly, so um, and and actually, Ina, yeah, this this might be something that that um, you talk about or that that your book might actually help give folks some guidance. How do you? What advice do you have for fellow Afro Latinos about how to advance themselves professionally? To achieve leadership roles, um, uh, it, particularly, obviously, you know, given that there's the, the the bias and racism that exists, that sometimes we have that that added sort of challenge and barrier to overcome. Are there insights and thoughts you all would have to share with folks? I think the work and is on us. We need to use these platforms and bring this conversation. Our younger Afro-Latino generation, generation is, you know, studying, working, doing, trying to, you know, make a future for, the, for themselves. We that are in the in different positions that we have achieved and that, that we have um, walked that path, we need to bring the conversation to the table, even if it's uncomfortable, bring it to the, you know, meetings in like corporate meetings, Talk about this and make sure that there is um, um, a diversity in our companies. What a difference makes having diversity in a newsroom, for example. Like no one can tell a story the way I do. No one felt discriminated the way I did. So when they are doing a story about discrimination, my, my voice counts. So we need, we have the responsibility to to clear the path for 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 the new generation. That's great. That's 
Yeah, and, and I'll even add on this, given that uh, we, we talk about this a lot at said, and I'll even uh, cite that, you know, said did an Afro-Latinos uh, webinar in August, and little do we know it was the most watched webinar ever in our organization's 34-year history, uh, which is interesting because um, 16 years ago, I made the cover page of Black Enterprise magazine, and they did a section on Afro-Latinos, and to this day, you know, years later, uh, Butch Graves, uh, the CEO, tells me it's still one of the most widely um, uh, bought issues uh, in the history of Black enterprise because of the fact that it was talking about Afro-Latinos. And so and, and so that's why to answer the question is to one, be proud to be Black, you know, be proud of our his heritage, be proud of the fact that we are of African ancestry, be proud of our Latino culture, because when you bring that pride, it brings the confidence. And when you bring the confidence, your, those that are around you will feel you're confident at not only who you are, but what you're doing in the workplace. And you're gonna see how that will resonate as your career and find those mentors. You know, one of mine is Julio Portalatin, who is the highest ranking Afro-Latino corporate executive in the world. He's the vice chairman at Marsh McLennan. Uh, and he's the only Afro-Latino ever to achieve the status of CEO of any Afro-Latino in the whole country. And so he's someone who I look to for, for mentorship. But find that mentor. Find those who, uh, who have achieved those. There are, there are many that are, that are out there. And I think that with that, and, and just remember where we come from so that those Afro-Latinos behind us can look to you for leadership and guidance. Yes. Yeah, and just on that, Sid and Ilya, I, I'm always, uh, I always hear people say things like, well, you, know, you want to make sure that someone is successful when you hire them because if they're not, it reflects poorly and, you know, we, we don't want an issue. Well, you don't really have that extra thought going on in your head when you're hiring someone who's not black, not Afro Latino, not a minority. If someone fails and he's a white man, all white men didn't just fail. Bob failed. And so we can't have this extra a burden on people, hire people, you know, don't, don't be afraid to hire someone. If they succeed, let's do everything we can to make them successful. If they don't, sometimes people aren't successful. It has nothing to do with whether they were Afro Latino or black or white or with sometimes people just aren't successful. Let's not allow that to limit us from hiring. Let's lean into this and help people. So what Ilya said about those of us here in, in, in corporations and businesses, what can we do? Hire people, give them a chance. Not all of them will be successful, I promise you that. But that doesn't mean that some of them won't be successful. Let's give people a chance. Yeah, that's a great point, Catherine. I think it was, I heard, I think it must have been like a comedian or someone I once heard who sort of said, you know, the true definition or when, when we know that we've truly achieved equity is when we all have the luxury of mediocrity, when we all can simply be you know, not outstanding and not because it doesn't reflect on our entire population, our entire race. Our entire race. Right. We're not carrying the entire black woman, Latin American race on our shoulders, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, speaking of, uh, and Sid, I think you alluded to this a little, uh, speaking about sort of embracing our blackness, right? I think we have a number of, uh, uh, judging from some of the questions, I think we have a number of our fellow Afro-Latinos watching, perhaps not surprising. Um, um, how do, have you encountered, and so how have you responded to, shall we say, a challenge or a skepticism from our brothers and sisters in the African-American community about our blackness, given that we're Afro-Latino? If, if, because there's that that other side of the coin, right, where we're not always embraced necessarily by that side of our, our, of our heritage either. Any thoughts or, or reactions to that? Whoever wants to. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. I, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is it, 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 absolutely yes. It, it, it happens in the Latino community. It happens in the African-American community. And, 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 and what often happens is some of what I call these litmus tests. You know, in other words, um, is your do do you trace your roots uh, to uh, uh, to former? Um, to, to, is your ancestry traced to slavery in the U.S.? Um, and sometimes, if it's not, uh, at least not in the U.S., then sometimes it, it, it goes back to that guest effect. Uh, and the uh, and and also um, it, it's it's the. Uh, sometimes it's this what I call this 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 false um, challenge that I that I feel that's out there. But sometimes there's perception that there's this black versus Latino, uh, and you know if there's advancement in the black community, you know what's happening with the Latino community? Is that at the at, at the expense? Is there a zero sum game? Which the answer is no. That we all can rise up. 
I tell people all the time that when people tell, talk to me about what's happened this year, particularly with the issue with the deaths of George Floyd, Amar Arbery, Breonna Taylor, the situation in Central Park with, with Christian Cooper, who had the woman that said that there's an African-American man threatening my life, and, and then Omar Jimenez at uh, CNN, who got arrested because he's Afro-Latino, um, you, you know, Black Lives Matters. Black Lives Matters. And we have to embrace to say that Black Lives Matter, and that includes the Black Lives within our Latino community. And uh, and so when uh, and so when we um, uh, as as Latinos uh, all embrace that, um, it's a way to build those collaborations so that when we have issues on immigration, then now uh, we are looking to uh, for collaboration from the African American community to stand by us. It's a great point. It's a great point. And a phrase I love that I've you know, heard said several times, used uh, many times this year, is this idea: no one's free until everyone's free. Right. And it's really a question right. about sort of thinking about sort of a universal justice and a universal equity. And that's that's critical. Um, great. Let's see. Another question that folks want to talk about. What is advice for our, uh, shall we say, uh, it's sometimes referred to. I know there's controversy around it, but sometimes referred to as sort of white Latinos, right, or say non Afro Latinos, maybe. Um, what is advice that you all might give to our th those members of our community to help them develop their consciousness, recognize the biases that are around them, and that might even be something that they're unwittingly playing into? Are there tips or guidance, play other than obviously educating themselves, other kind of insights you all would share with them? So I, I have a strong feeling about this. You know, when we think about women's suffrage here in the United States, uh, women didn't earn the vote because only women participated in this. When we think about the progress that women have made as we've gone along over the last century, women didn't make that problem uh, progress because only women engage. You know, men engage too. They say, well, I want my daughter to be successful. So we need to make sure this glass ceiling doesn't exist. It required everyone working on the problem. So if we take that same mindset and we say, how is it that we're going to make more progress as Afro-Latinos or as Black people in this country, well, it's not going to be with just us owning this and seeing it as an issue, acknowledging that it's an issue, and trying to work to correct the situation. So it takes our um, non-Black Latinos, it takes non-Latinos, it takes everyone. And so if anyone wants to, to know what they can do, just get engaged. Again, hire someone, mentor someone, give someone a chance. And uh, if we all acknowledge that the situation exists and we all engage, then we, we won't be able to do anything but improve. That's great. Thank you. Nothing to add. Um, um, well, I'll, well, real quick, I'll just say yeah. that quickly, is also just to, uh, for those Latinos that are not Afro-Latinos, know our history. You know, go to Luisa, Puerto Rico. Go to Samana, Dominican Republic, or Barahona, where my family's from. You know, go to Cartagena, Colombia, go to Veracruz, Mexico, um, all of these cities in Latin America, where, which were the centers of Afro-Latino culture, because then by understanding us, you'll know how to embrace us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, 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 and it's just like, do not ignore the, this uncomfortable um, conversation. It's, we need to address it. For a lot of people, racism is like taboo. But be, this can be a taboo because, you know, as there is inequity in health, in jobs, in education and judicial system. So this conversation is necessary and, and non-Black Hispanics need to address it as well and need to recognize that there is racism within our Hispanic community, address it in the houses and try to, you know, work together to, to find a solution. This is not a one-time conversation with your family. This is a conversation that takes, you know, long and takes every single opportunity to, to address it and to educate ourselves about it. That's great. All right, so Marco, I forgot one, one last thing. One, one oh, last yeah, thing, I'm please. sorry, one, one quick one, quick one. And that is, um, Latino and African-American organizations need to think about the diversity on their boards. If you're an African-American organization, you have no Afro-Latinos. If you're a Latino organization, you have no Afro-Latinos. You don't have the full diversity in the full picture. And so I call on both communities uh, to make sure that there is diversity on your boards. And of course, for the non-diverse organizations uh, there, 
that you need to have diversity on there and make sure that you're thinking about Afro-Latinos. It's a great, great point. In fact, in fact, and, and leads right into my, my last question here that some folks have talked about as well. Um, uh, how, what is your advice for how we increase the visibility and the representation of Afro-Latinos, whether it be in front of the camera Right, so maybe yeah, you may have thoughts on that in terms of increasing diversity uh, uh, in media, but also in corporate America, right? In 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 in, in not just nonprofits, but in corporate boards, right? In corporate C suites, uh, etc. How do we help elevate uh, the Afro Latino population uh, so that both they achieve greater leadership, but also again so that they're in more visible positions, so that in fact more folks encounter them and it becomes less of a of a of a surprise to, to folks to know that we're here. I think it's time for marketing and you know commercial experts to understand that diversity is not simply Hispanics, that we are part of an important part of the Hispanic community, Afro-Latinos. Um, we need to help push Afro-Latino businesses, push the economy, push uh, um, support women, that are you know the 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 head of the house, and 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 make sure that you know everybody's able to you know have their businesses, own a house, grow economically and financially, and and you know keep the economy uh, the economy moving. As as I said before, the decision makers, the decision makers need to believe in the power of diversity, not only in 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 my industry. But support uh, kids in school, um, colleges, uh, scholarships, mentor, as, as Sid said, that is, a, a, you know, really important to 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 start a, um, a grassroots for you know a better a better treatment for our Latino um, Afro Latino community. That's great. That's great. All right, so we're we're just about at time, and so if you have an answer or extra insight to this. I'll ask you to, if you can, work that into your closing comments. Any final words, uh, reflections, advice for the audience on this topic? You want to start, Sid? Sure. I'll, I'll be uh, brief with the uh, two minutes we have left. One is that, um, yes, corporate America, when they're advertising to Latinos, must have diversity as to how they portray the, uh, the characters that are in these commercials promoting their products. Because uh, it's not unusual that Afro-Latinos uh, we'll we'll uh, look at the uh, Spanish commercials and people that don't look like us, and then the English ones that see that see uh, that have black people where there's things that that we embrace. So make sure that you're embracing that. And secondly, is that if you're ever in a meeting and there's no one else that looks like you, I do what I call declare. Declare means just get up and, and say, "Mi nombre es Wilson, soy dominicano de pura cepa, y ya tú sabes, mi gente." Something like that, and they don't know what you're talking about. And I say, just pull out your Google Translate and you'll figure it out. But just so you know, that que tu aquí, que tu presente y pa'lante mi gente. That's awesome. I, 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 I want to add something because in, in, in my book, I mentioned one experience that I had. And I was not invited to two casting because of the color of my skin. Because the person that decides who goes to casting thought that a black woman couldn't be an anchor, a national anchor in Colombia. But it was an ally because I call her an ally. And, and she was white that said, excuse me, there is someone missing here. I was the only anchor in the entire Medellin that wasn't invited to the casting. And she stepped up and said, Ilia, we are missing Ilia Calderon here. You don't know who she is? Turn on your TV, watch her because she's doing the local news. And I was invited to the casting and I got that job. And I became the first Afro-Latina to anchor in, in Colombia. But yes, we need those allies. And those allies are formed in the house, in the house. That's why I go, I always go to the parents part, to the family part, because before talking to your kid about racism, check your biases, check what you're saying, check the way you are. Do you talk about equality? Do you talk about, um, you know, in which way you, you approach racism? So check your biases before talking to your kids, let them, you know, say what they think and start a conversation that is really necessary because we all need an ally. That's great. Catherine, final word. 
Sure, I guess I'll throw in there again, the corporate perspective. As we go back to our corporations, let's urge our leaders, right, to, to be an ally, as Elia said, and, and something that our CEO did once, uh, again, dealing with women, he got to a panel and there were all white men on the panel. And he said, I'm just not sitting on this panel. If you want someone, you can have someone from my team who's a woman or who's someone else. And um, I think it really starts there. So let's, not again, not only focus on women in the situation there, but how do we extend that to make sure we're seeing the same gaps when it comes to uh, Afro-Latinos. And uh, again, let's, it, from a corporate perspective, we've got such an awesome responsibility because there's so much good work we can do using that corporate, uh, I don't want to say club, but corporate opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's great. What, one more. So much. What, what, yeah. what, one, black books that talk about uh, prominent black people are not only for black kids. Read to your kids the history of the black people in America. Absolutely. That's, That's a great point. I, I want to say anything else. <laughs> That's a great point to end on. No, no, for sure. We need to know our history and we need to know our context. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much to my panel, uh, Sid Wilson, Ilya Calderon, Catherine Unger. Also want to thank Congressman Adriano Espaillat, who joined us earlier and was able to be here for part of this. It's been a really powerful discussion. Let's continue it online. Remember, engage with us, continue to tweet and, and, and post uh, using the hashtag CHCIHHM20. Also want to encourage you all to uh, attend the sessions for the rest of today and tomorrow. Uh, we know there's there's many more important conversations in our community being faced um, and, th and that we're providing solutions for. Uh, remind your friends that they can still log in and register for free to join us. Uh, simply going to chci. Uh, sorry, chihhm.live. Actually, that's now our website. Um, they can lo log in, register, and they can even see sessions from earlier this week. Uh, that are now available for replay. So please pass that on. And of course, don't forget to join us on Monday, uh, uh, September 21st, uh, for our uh, gala celebration, uh, 6 to 8 p.m., right back here on this site. Um, and again, remember, being registered for this conference means you are registered for the gala. So there's nothing uh, more you'll have to do than log back in. So thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day and rest of the conference. And we'll see you all soon.